I remember something happening to me the first time I played Zelda Ocarina of Time as a kid. It was just this weird feeling I had, but looking back at it, I think that feeling marked the moment I became a lifelong Zelda fan. I've never been quite able to put that feeling into words, but I remember the exact point in the game when it happened. I was hooked. The Zelda series has always had a kind of magic to it, a sense of myth that made it feel like more than just a game. In Ocarina, it didn't matter that the backgrounds were so obviously painted in, or that all the NPCs had pointy heads because of the low polygon count. Hyrule felt like a real place, more than real even, and a big part of that feeling came from the game's sound design. Koji Kondo's music poured out over the game and transformed it from just a digital box into a world, and gave each place its own distinct feeling and personality. Zora's domain felt like... While scaling Death Mountain was... While getting lost in the woods was more... Ocarina's music had a lot that made it special. For example, much of the game's music shunned the regular major and minor scales in favor of using church modes from the Middle Ages, lending the music a mysterious otherworldly feeling. The coolest part, though, was that those melodies didn't just stay apart of the background. The game literally gave you an instrument to play and transformed its soundtrack into a game mechanic. With just a five-note ocarina, you could harness the power of that world's music and use it to open doors and cast spells. In his 2004 essay Play Along, media theorist Zach Whalen described ocarina's musical themes as leitmotifs in reverse. A leitmotif is a musical phrase or idea that gets used and reused in a dramatic work to signify something. They were originally used by Richard Wagner to represent characters, objects, and ideas in his operas. Wagner's intention was to create a corresponding musical evolution of leitmotifs to go with the evolution of characters in the opera story. The reason why Whalen calls Ocarina's music leitmotifs in reverse is that whereas classically leitmotifs have been used to illustrate characters and objects brought to the stage, Zelda's leitmotifs are instead used to illustrate locations that the player travels to during the course of gameplay. Musical themes are recycled to signify dramatic change, like in Wagner's operas, but unlike in Wagner, these leitmotifs unfold at the player's discretion and not the composer's. This reversal of Wagner's musical logic is what I really want to talk about. It's funny, because I think if Wagner had lived to see it, he would have hated it. Wagner was a bit of a narcissist megalomaniac. He believed that European culture had fallen into decadence and decay, and that he and his music represented a chance at redemption and rebirth into its former glory. He would take money, he would steal the wives of his patrons, and he would feel personally entitled doing all of it because he felt it was what the world owed him for his wonderful music. Wagner, you made music sick. Wagner represents the culmination of the cult of creative genius, a trend in European Romanticism that saw music as a kind of mystical force, and composers as these inspired prophets of supreme creative genius. Corresponding with this vision is Wagnerian opera and the classic Wagnerian leitmotifs, 
These complex webs of interwoven musical threads that unfold at the composer's discretion and are thrust upon a passive audience, who is meant to just sit there and receive it like divine revelation. The interactive nature of video games made it impossible for composers to exert that same kind of control or create the same kind of complex musical architecture. Games don't present us a fixed score the way movies or operas do. They work more like a sample bank, with the gamer functioning like a DJ. Koji Kondo couldn't just thrust his artistic vision on us like Wagner did. Rather, he needed to write very elastic music that could transition according to the player's whims. Area music needed to be arranged so that it could loop for however long the player wanted to spend somewhere, and it needed to be able to transition from any point into a new theme. All of this added up to a musical experience which is only partially the composer's creation. In video games, the player takes a very active role in creating the music they hear. There are a lot of games I could talk about getting into the history of video game music. The reason why Ocarina of Time sticks out in particular for me, however, is the game's eponymous mechanic, the Ocarina itself. I take the Ocarina as a prime example of mechanic as metaphor. The ability it gave us in-game to create these little musical spells was representative of something much bigger a shift in power from the lone composer to the player audience. Music in the Zelda universe retains all the magical power and importance it had in Wagner's day, but no longer is its creation considered the exclusive domain of some few inspired geniuses. The player has the ocarina. The player has a part in the music. This shift in power isn't something confined to the world of video games either. All digital media inherently encourages interactivity, and what started as a cute gimmick in the gaming of the 90s has gone on to become a cornerstone for today's media giants. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and of course YouTube all rely on their own mass audience playing an active role as content creators. The people who grew up playing and listening to Zelda are also the people who became the first generation on YouTube, a generation defined by its ability to democratically produce its own media, and well, it shows.